on World News Tonight. Disaster in China. The economic powerhouse in Asia witnesses a second round of earthquakes this month, pushing the first responders to immediate action. The January 6th calamity. The House of Representatives Select Committee begins its hearings on the Capitol riots, with intense pressure being put on the former President Trump's behavior. Troubling times. Warnings are being released on global food shortages, with the United States seeing some of the highest fuel prices ever on record. And rowing away. An iconic attraction in one of the most beautiful cities in the world provides some peace during these times. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Earlier today, an earthquake of 6.0 in magnitude struck the Sichuan province in China. An earthquake of similar magnitude struck the province last week as well. Residents have been alerted to pay close attention to weather reports in the coming days. The quake was at a depth of 19.9 kilometers and was centered about 248 kilometers northwest of Taipeng. The province has activated a level 3 emergency response for the earthquake. More than 750 members of the fire department have been dispatched to the epicenter. Disaster relief operations are underway in an orderly manner. Additionally, 425 rescuers, 95 vehicles and 9 rescue dogs were deployed from the prefecture nearby cities to join the rescue efforts. Officials may temporarily shut down transportation infrastructure in the tremor zone to check for damage. Minor disruptions are expected during shutdowns, but service will likely resume quickly if no damage is found. Over to the United States now, Liz Cheney, the Republican Vice Chair of the House of Representatives Select Committee on the Capitol Riots, said that former President Donald Trump had lit the flame of this attack. The hearing, which continues, made it a point to bring back footage and the memories of the January 6th event last year. The Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. And with that gavel, the January 6th primetime hearings began. Democrat Benny Thompson starting the night off. Donald Trump was at the center of this conspiracy. And ultimately, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, spurred a mob of domestic enemies of the Constitution to march down the Capitol and subvert American democracy. Republican Liz Cheney laying the groundwork. Those who invaded our Capitol and battled law enforcement for hours were motivated by what President Trump had told them, that the election was stolen and that he was the rightful president. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. And soon after, the words from the former president's own attorney general dismissing any claims that the 2020 election was stolen. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was and, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. And that's one of the reasons that went into me deciding to leave when I did. I observed, uh, I think it was on December 1st, that, you know, how can we, you can't live in a world where, where the incumbent administration stays in power based on its view, unsupported by specific evidence, that the election, that there was fraud in the election. A message the committee says the former president heard repeatedly. Repeatedly uh, told the president in no uncertain terms uh, that uh, I did not see evidence of fraud uh, and, uh, you know, that would have affected the outcome uh, of the election. And frankly, a year and a half later, I haven't seen anything to, to change my mind on that. The committee promising over the next few weeks to show a correlation between the president, those closest to him, and the people committing those acts of violence that day. And Vice Chair Republican Liz Cheney, who has faced ridicule from her own party over continuing to call out the former president for his actions with this message to her colleagues. Tonight, I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone but your dishonor will remain. In all 50 states in the United States, the average price of a gallon of gas stood above $4.4. .4. 
but costs ranged considerably across the region. In California, drivers had to pay over $6.4 a gallon, which is over 600 rupees per litre of gasoline. Okay, we're ready to go on the road again. Day 11 of the real family's cross-country road trip. And we are heading to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. When they left Tucson in their Chrysler Pacifica, they were paying $4.49 a gallon, $4.59 in St. Louis, $5.18 in Illinois. Their six-week trip costing more every day. Driving through the Midwest to Niagara Falls, then Cooperstown, on to New England, down the East Coast, to New Orleans, then across I-10 and back to Arizona. Arizona. They'd hoped driving would be cheaper than flying and renting cars, but so far they're paying 70 to 80 dollars to fill their tank. Two weeks ago, five dollars sounded insanely high, and now all of a sudden that's a bargain. Driving prices higher, a strong economy, the end of lockdowns in China, the Russian oil embargo, and far fewer refineries in the U.S. Six refineries, more than a million barrels of capacity each day, shut down over the last three years amid costly maintenance and environmental regulations. Now oil companies are drilling and pumping more oil in the U.S., projected to hit an all-time high next year. Refineries in the United States are running full out, and if they're not running full out, it's because they're currently performing some maintenance. The global crop yield is forecast to be smaller than usual this year. The EU is expecting a drop in wheat production and other global bread baskets, including India and Australia, and may always see smaller than usual grain harvests. This is mostly due to dry weather across the world. Europe's wheat harvest is expected to tumble this year. The European Union is expected to produce 5% less wheat than last year, according to Strategy Grains, a consulting firm for agriculture. France, which makes up almost a fifth of Europe's agricultural production, is also facing ahead a 5% drop in wheat. The disappointing harvest forecast is stoking worries as supplies from two of the world's biggest wheat and grain exporters, Ukraine and Russia, are affected by the war in Ukraine, and only a few countries are left to pick up the slack in global wheat supplies. Analysts had earlier forecast disappointing crop yields in other global bread baskets, including India, Australia and China. The smaller-than-usual wheat harvest can be attributed to the dry weather. I think it's going to affect us both in terms of domestic production and global production because the uh, weird weather is apparently hitting everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, lack of uh, rain seems to be a global problem, not just a Korean one. A pinch in wheat supplies could drive up food prices, not just for bread, but also for meat. A lot of that grain was used for livestock feed. And we probably will have enough money to uh, feed the people. We will probably have enough grain to feed the people, uh, but it will raise the uh, price of livestock. And that's probably behind what's uh, the uh, rise in prices of uh, beef and pork globally. The European Central Bank ended a long-running stimulus scheme and said it would deliver next month its first interest rate hike since 2011 followed by a potentially larger move in September. The European Central Bank could be on course for its first interest rate hike in 11 years. On Thursday, the Central Bank ended a long-running stimulus scheme and indicated the hike could come next month, while an even larger move could follow in September. ECB President Christine Lagarde. High inflation is a major challenge for all of us. The Governing Council will make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. The ECB said it would end bond buys on July 1st and raise interest rates by 25 basis points later that month. September's potential hike could go to 50 basis points, but that isn't guaranteed. The calibration of this rate increase will depend on the updated medium-term inflation outlook. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists, or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. The rise in energy and food prices and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have driven inflation now running at over 
ECB policymakers have hotly debated how to respond, with some arguing for bigger rate hikes than others. The ECB announced Thursday it expects inflation to reach 6.8% this year, up from a previous forecast of just over 5%. Markets now expect even more rate hikes before January, posing awkward questions for Lagarde, who only recently said no increase was likely this year. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Let's get to the latest from the Ukrainian crisis. Now, the governor of Luhansk says fighting is raging in the key city as Russia intensifies efforts to take the region's stronghold. Meanwhile, already reeling from the war, the local economy of the port city of Odessa in southwestern Ukraine is now set to take a huge hit to its tourism industry. This year, as its beaches lie empty except for mines. The once busy Black Sea beaches in the Ukrainian resort Odessa are deserted. The white sand where tourists used to sunbathe is now littered with mines, while police patrol the boardwalks. In early May, Russian forces pounded the port with missiles, leaving buildings in Odessa in ruin. Reeling from the war, the local economy is now set to take a huge hit to its tourism industry this year. Ukraine's military planted mines along the coast of the southwestern port city in case of a Russian amphibious assault, cordoning off the beaches to ensure civilians don't get hurt. Military spokeswoman for the region, Natalia Humanik, says the measures are a necessary sacrifice to aid the war effort. We realise that tourism and the recreational business are an important element for the economy. But we also realise that if we don't hold the defence of our region, there will be no economy. So we try to find a maximum compromise to give business a possibility to function without hurting the economy. No foreigners are arriving on Odessa's beaches for a holiday, leaving just internally displaced people, aid workers and journalists. All Group's tourism office owner, Alexander Babic, says he works for for free in a display of charity and gratitude. Tourism, you understand, is not only about street tours. It's hotels, restaurants, souvenirs, all kinds of beach services. It's things related to the cultural sector. Theatres are actively visited during the summer season, different concerts. It was very big money. I don't know how the city economy will do without them. Some residents can't imagine life without the sea and sand, leading to reports of rule breakers dipping their toes into the water under the cover of night. But others say that summering on the beach is a small price to pay for advancing the war effort. Five countries have been elected to serve the United Nations Security Council as non-permanent members beginning from the 1st of January 2023. The non-permanent members ran largely uncontested in the General Assembly, amassing over 184 votes each. The new countries will be replacing India, Ireland, Kenya, Mexico and Norway. They will be joining the five permanent members and the likes of Albania, Brazil, Gabon, Ghana and the UAE. Japan has been voted onto the UN Security Council for a record 12th time. It was elected to the council on Thursday for a two-year term starting January 1st next year. Japan was last voted onto the council in 2015. Switzerland, Mozambique, Malta and Ecuador were also voted onto the council along with Japan. The UN Security Council has 15 members, five of which are permanent, filled by the US, Russia, China, France and Britain. The rest are voted in for two-year terms. Japan's appointment comes at a time when the council is facing challenges due to Russia exercising its veto power over its aggression in Ukraine. An mRNA vaccine factory will be constructed in Africa by BioNTech to supply the vaccination demand within the region. COVID-19 vaccine maker BioNTech said construction of an mRNA vaccine factory to serve Africa is set to begin in Rwanda. It follows a pledge by the biotech firm to secure mRNA vaccine production on the continent, where inoculation rates have fallen far behind other parts of the world. Construction is set to begin on June the 23rd. BioNTech partnered with Pfizer to develop the Western world's most widely used COVID-19 shot. The initial factory will be built from an assembly kit and housed in two groups of six 40-foot shipping containers. 
These modular factory elements, which will be assembled in Africa to so-called biontainers, will be delivered to the Kigali construction site by the end of 2022, BioNTech said in a statement. The factory should kick off vaccine production about 12 months after the delivery of the assembly kit. It is hoped the initial vaccine factory would become part of a wider supply network spanning several African nations, including Senegal and South Africa, over the next few years. The project push comes as Western-made coronavirus vaccine doses finally arrive in force on the continent after a much-criticised delay. But uptake in Africa has fallen short of expectations, hurt by misinformation, logistical problems and a lacking sense of urgency in the population, among other factors. BioNTech has said the BioNTainers could make other mRNA vaccines against malaria or tuberculosis, depending on product development progress and future public health priorities. After a decade of trading as Facebook, the social media giant is transitioning from its all corporate branding as it begins trading under the ticker symbol Meta. The final touches of Facebook's facelift appear to be complete. The social media company on Thursday began for the first time trading under the ticker symbol Meta, the umbrella title it adopted last year as part of a corporate rebranding effort. At the time, founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg explained that his company was now more about building a metaverse, blending online, virtual and augmented worlds. But the name change also came as Facebook was coming under fire from lawmakers and regulators for failing to appropriately curb hate speech, inflammatory rhetoric and misinformation. The Federal Trade Commission had also filed an antitrust lawsuit against the company for alleged anti-competitive practices, a suit that is still pending. The company's shares have fallen nearly 42 percent in 2022 as it continues to battle criticism over its market power, algorithmic decisions and its policing of abuses. Meta includes popular social media apps Instagram and WhatsApp and, of course, the flagship site, still called Facebook, which continues to be firmly entrenched in the universe with its nearly 3 billion monthly users. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. President Biden reached out to President Bolsonaro, a far-right populist, in a large-dish attempt to save Hemispheric Summit. While President Bolsonaro will use a meeting with the world's most powerful man to boost his image as he heads into a tough re-election campaign. BRICS nations have come together to address the issues with regards to the global food crisis. The meeting adopted a joint statement of BRICS agricultural ministers and a document on BRICS food security cooperation strategy. It also announced the establishment of a forum on the agriculture and rural affairs development of BRICS countries. Iran has started removing 27 surveillance cameras installed by UN inspectors at nuclear sites around the country, widening a dispute over Tehran's program as it enriches uranium closer than ever to weapons grade levels. Director General of International Atomic Energy Agency Rafael Grossi stated that the sites that would see cameras removed include its underground Natanz nuclear enrichment facility as well as its facility in Isfahan. NATO forces conducted live fire air defense exercises in Poland to test their readiness to respond to aircraft, drone and missile attacks. 17 NATO allies and partner countries are participating in the exercises. Deputy Commander of NATO's Allied Air Command Pascal Dillert said Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been seen an increase of missiles, fight aircraft and unmanned aerial vehicles close to the border of NATO countries. The Professional Golfers Association Tour has suspended the players participating in the inaugural Saudi back Live Golf Invitational Series. PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan said the suspended players are no longer eligible to compete in all PGA Tour events, the President's Cup and all tours sanctioned by the PGA Tour. He stated that the choice made by the players for financial reasons cannot expect the PGA to offer its membership benefits. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep to you up to date with the latest from around the world. In, in case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight, here is a look at Venice's Vogolonga's Regatta. 
an attraction that brings together people from across the world to one of the world's most beautiful sites. Have a good night.